Hello and welcome to Learn Data. It's great to have you on this channel. I'm Nilesh and in this video, we'll talk about the intuition behind Gaussian processes. These are the topics we'll cover. What is Gaussian, multivariate Gaussian, sampling, so let's get decomposition and also uh, look at what the covariance and mean uh, are, how important it is in the Gaussian processes. Before we start, the discussion here are some references i want to share and uh, the main reference that the video draws on is this lecture by nando de freitas uh, which is introduction to machine gaussian processes and then uh, these two references by rasmussen uh, additionally uh, i'd suggest page 111 from the kevin murphy's book uh, which is machine learning uh, probabilistic perspective so what is gaussian you probably already heard about the bell shaped curve and that's what we are going to talk about here let's say assume, uh, let's think of a farm which has several apple trees and you're trying to uh, measure or count how many apples are there on each tree and when we uh, count that and put the histogram we can calculate or come up with this uh, probability density curve as shown on the left hand side where we have the number of apples per tree on the x-axis and the probability density on the y-axis and this is shown by this blue curve that we see and the yellow orange dotted line is the mean where in this case the mean is 250 now we can zero mean this data uh, what I mean by that we can subtract the mean 250 from these readings and we can get the plot on the right hand side where we still have the same probability density but then we have the x-axis values that are now centered at zero value so this is this particular curve is an example of a normal distribution or a gaussian distribution and here is a further variation of that in this case uh, again we have this histogram and in this time the plot looks little different because i've used different values for this and here we can see the bell shaped curve that you are familiar with and in this particular plot we have the mean centered at zero and uh, for now i see that the values are minus three minus two so let's ignore that for now as it does not compare with the previous slide uh, but uh, the idea here was to get this shape of the curve uh, perfectly gaussian and we have the mean at centered at zero now from this particular plot we can construct a cumulative distribution plot which is shown up top where which is uh, the way this plot is calculated is by taking adding the area as we go from left to right from the pl plot here at the bottom so we add the area up here plot it here and then take a cumulative sum of the area behind each of these points and then plot them here such that now the mean here would be right at the center of this particular plot and the area of this curve sums to one under the curve sums to one and again uh, so the cumulative distribution plot as it goes up top it uh, uh, the max value it approaches one now formally we can represent the gaussian distribution by this particular formula here which is given by f of x is equal to 1 divided by sigma square root of 2 pi and this exponential term where mu is the mean and here sigma is the standard deviation so a probability density function then in the univariate, univariate case uh, which is to say that if you just have one variable such as uh, just the number of uh, apples on a tree uh, could be uh, represented like this as shown in the plot on the right hand side and in this plot now we'll add some additional information uh, so the center is the mean which we know now on the left and right we see this uh, orange dotted lines which represents how many standard deviations away from the mean that particular uh, 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 region is so here we are at 
one standard deviation less than mean and that is shown here by mu minus sigma and so on uh, all the way up to minus three and on the right hand side we have mu plus sigma so this is uh, one standard deviation away from the mean on the that is greater than the mean and this particular plot is very important and what it tells us is that 68 percent of uh, the data points lie between minus one and plus one so um, minus uh, so that's plus minus one standard deviation from the mean so the 68 percent of the apples uh, 68 percent of the trees would have the count of apples within uh, this range and then 95 percent would have uh, 95 percent of the trees would have uh, the count of apples that is plus minus two standard deviations away from the mean and finally 99.7 percent would have uh, the values within plus or minus three sigma or plus or minus three standard deviation and this is the uh, main gaussian curve that is used later on to get samples get the mean get standard deviation yeah and so far we looked at a univariate case that is just one feature or one variable now imagine in addition to counting the number of apples on a tree we are also interested in counting the average weight of apples on a tree average weight of an apple and so those features now if we have two features the plot would look something like this as shown here in the blue and again the y-axis represents the probability density but now this probability density is a joint probability combined probability for both the features and that's why we have this x1 comma x2 now that's the multivariate case now in case of uh, on this plot we are going to talk more about how the multivariate case uh, could be understood so on the left hand side we have uh, data points uh, let's imagine this could be a variable x uh, one variable on the y axis and another variable on the x axis uh, by variables i mean features and these orange data points represent um, the, the so each co the coordinate of each orange data point would be feature on the x axis value of feature on the x axis and then value of feature on the y-axis and the blue denotes the centroid so in this case we have the center which is the mean it is at zero and therefore uh, down below we see that we have zero written here and on the right hand side we have uh, let's say we have the same features but then the distribution of uh, the location the spread of the points is at an angle and there seems to be some trend in these particular data points as compared to the one on the left so the uh, takeaway message from these two plots is that here if we change the value of one of the features there is seems to be no effect on the value of other features and therefore these are uncorrelated whereas on the right hand side if we increase one feature if we go um, on this side uh, let's say we are going along the x-axis the values along the y-axis also seem to increase and so uh, or decrease if we go on the other side and so there seems to be a correlation between those two features and what that's what these two uh, diagrams show now to put it in a mathematical terms what we have are the um, uh, equation shown below on the left hand side what this is saying that if we have two features x uh, x1 and x2 uh, they are drawn from the normal gaussian so gaussian n represents the normal for gaussian uh, which has the properties or characteristics of mu or mean as zero and the covariance matrix it looks like this so where one represents the variances for each of those and zero represents the covariance so here because they are not correlated 
therefore those values are zero and therefore this is an identity matrix so if you see points that are spread like this it means that they have a covariance matrix that is close to what we see here where off diagonal elements are zero on the other hand on the right hand side we see that these are correlated and there seems to be a high correlation between the two features and therefore we have value of 0.8 so uh, in this case we do have the variances as one but then we have the covariances that are non-zero values and those two uh, features let's imagine they are shown as these plots here and when we try to when we are talking about joint probability what we are, are doing is essentially uh, looking at them together so these are then the data points that we are looking at which are a combination of both of those features and thus we come up with this uh, we can uh, get this plot for the joint probability distribution that we've seen earlier now what we are interested for gaussian processes is uh, getting a conditional probability distribution from this so what we are trying to say is that given one of the features how does the distribution of uh, how does the probability distribution look so if we create a cut in this particular uh, plot and if we look from this side onto this particular surface we would see a gaussian we would see a curve such as shown here on the right hand side and what that curve is is the probability of x2 given x1 and here again this particular vertical bar shows that it's a conditional probability so probability of x2 conditioned on x1 so in this case we are cutting this at a value of x small x1 which is shown by this orange dotted uh, rectangle so in this plot then uh, what we need to find is the mu which is the center and the standard deviations so on the left hand side let's say we have the center of this uh, centroid of this particular um, joint probability distribution given by mu1 a vector mu1 and mu2 corresponding to the features x1 and x2 then uh, we can say that this particular distribution comes from a normal gaussian where the mean is given by this vector and covariance is given by this capital sigma 1 1 uh, and capital sigma 1 2 and then sigma 2 1 and sigma 2 2 so these diagonal terms 1 1 and 2 2 those are the variances and then the sigma 1 2 and 2 1 are the those are the covariances so overall that's the covariance matrix and so we can use that to find the value for the uh, con uh, the me mean mu 1 2 and the variance uh, one to for this particular conditional probability distribution and uh, that is given by this formula we are not going through the derivations but this is the uh, relation that we can use to find these two particular values that are used in the gaussian processes so here we have sigma one two is given by sigma one one minus sigma 1 2 and then inverse of sigma 2 2 and sigma 2 1 and then for mu 2 we have this relation given here which is uh, this variance term is added to the mean of mu 1 which is on which this particular uh, uh, plot or curve is conditioned on and similarly for um, the variance we have this variance of x1 from which these values are subtracted so that's the central idea behind uh, going from a joint probability deduction of two features to a conditional probability in which we are interested in and if there are more than two features then this uh, would be a multi-dimensional plot and 
thus uh, this coherence matrix would have many more dimensions to it now let's talk about sampling from a gaussian distribution so what sampling means is let's say uh, we have a, a let's say a, a bag in which we have uh, maybe red apples and green apples and if we uh, pull take one apple from that particular bag then we are actually sampling that apple from the bag uh, so in this particular case that's the idea we are going to use where we have a distribution such as shown here on the conditional distribution which is shown here on the bottom and we are going to draw on data points from that so we'll get mean values out of that particular distribution uh, we can get infinite number of values so we can restrict to get getting a few values and we'll use that particular process of getting values from that is called sampling and uh, how do we do that in this case so uh, let's say we have uh, uh, to pick a particular data form we start out with a uniform distribution and based on that we look at the corresponding value on the cumulative distribution plot and then for that value we pick a value for the from the gaussian that's down below and that's uh, what i've tried to plot here on the right hand side so we can repeat the process so we collect two points three points and so we can get a sample of uh, the data points from this particular uh, gaussian that we have and uh, as you will notice most of the points that we would sample would tend to be close to uh, the mu or the mean of this distribution as we see right here and why we are talking about the sampling is because in Gaussian processes, the idea is to start out with unobserved data. And what we do is we, uh, let's say we can start with uh, some of the test data. We'll pull some random samples from that and then create a covariance matrix and then use that covariance matrix uh, as a prior to get our posterior probabilities now uh, this is uh, putting it in mathematical terms how for sampling so in this particular equation it, it is um, saying that we are sampling uh, the point data point xi from a, a normal gaussian distribution which has a mean of zero and variance of one and if the mean is not zero, then uh, we have uh, it written in this form where we are sampling it from mean mu and variance sigma square. Now this form can be written as the equation shown below, which is mu plus sigma uh, into um, uh, Gaussian, normal Gaussian with a mean of zero and variance as one. So this is a very important equation as we'll see later on and uh, here if we have a vector of features then this is the uh, format where we can say that these this vector is drawn from a gaussian uh, which has a mean of zero and a coherence matrix in this case that's a identity matrix now in case of multivariate gaussian uh, the bold mu is uh, denoting uh, the vector mean vector mu1 mu2 again the bold sigma capital sigma is denoting this particular covariance matrix and the marginals are given by these two relation here for the uh, probability for x1 and x2 and you may want to check out the references if you need more information on these two so for a multivariate Gaussian then what we have is this relation where we are saying that the vector of features x1 and x2 uh, is drawn from a normal Gaussian with mean mu1 mu2 and the covariance matrix which is given here 
so that can be summarized and written in a form such as shown here uh, and to go from this format to this particular form where we now have mu plus l and then we have a normal gaussian with zero mean and identity matrix so to go from this form to this form we need to take a square root and to help with that there is a step which involves Cholesky decomposition and uh, we won't go into the derivation but just wanted to mention that uh, is an important step in there so what that particular uh, uh, decomposition is is basically you if you have a symmetric uh, positive definite matrix where eigenvalues are positive uh, you can split that matrix uh, such that you get this matrix shown here l which has lower triangular uh, lower triangle which has values and the upper triangular is zero uh, if you multiply this l with its transfers then we get the original matrix back such as shown here so that's uh, what this decomposition is and that is what we'll do when we do the coding in next video where we'll perform this decomposition to cal when we are working the coherence matrices now for multivariate Gaussian uh, when we are talking about regression let's look at another example here on the left hand side we have this plot with orange dots and uh, those are represented by x1 x2 and x3 and on the y-axis we now have functions so function f1 function f2 and function f3 so those are the values uh, from a Gaussian function and that can again be represented as shown in this relation here which is a, a vector of the functions that is from a gaussian with zero mean and covariance denoted by these values of k k11 two, two, three, three are the variances and then we have the covariances k1213 and the reason why we are discussing this is because uh, if uh, the covariance matrix is kind of the heart of the entire Gaussian process. What the covariance matrix captures is the similarity between data points or how close two data points are or how far they are. And that we can see in the values for the covariance, these off diagonal values. In this small example, uh, we can see that. I'll, the value of 0.8 suggests that the values are correlated and so they must be closer together and that's why we have these two values for f1 and f2 they are much closer data points as we see however the value for uh, f1 with so k13 which is between data points 1 and 3 x1 and x3 they are much farther apart and therefore there is less correlation and therefore we have a lesser covariance there so that's uh, uh, if anything you take away from this video uh, this is the point that a covariance matrix helps you find what data points are closer and what data points are farther apart so with with that in mind how do we then find this particular covariance matrix or similarity matrix and that's where the kernels come in so here we have one kernel uh, kij which is uh, squared f exponential so we have the differences between these values for the features coordinates and then those are uh, exponentiated so kernels are a, a big step in helping us find these coherences that tell us how close or farther apart these data points are and this is now you if you're wondering if there are different kernels so yes there are uh, several kernels that can be used based on the type of data that you are working with to find uh, uh, this similarity and in this particular case you would expect that if the values for the this exponentiated term is more larger 
uh, then the value for k would be smaller so let's say if we have a value closer to infinity saying that those two uh, data points are very very far apart then the resulting value for that particular uh, covariance or that particular those two data points in the covariance matrix or kernel would be closer to zero whereas if they are much closer let's say if we will, if we are looking at just the same data point together then this value would become zero because there's no distance between because if we are looking at the same data point and so the value of that would become one and therefore that's the highest value we'll get for uh, closer data points in the kernel output kernel so that's the second point uh, to remember from this slide now this particular covariance uh, this term on the top right you can uh, abbreviate it and write in this uh, notation where f comes from a, a function f comes from a gaussian with zero mean and covariance k or kernel k and now imagine on the left hand side we have a new magenta color data point uh, x star so that's the test data point and that's what we want to do is we want to predict the va f value for that particular data point and so we could assume that that data point also comes from a gaussian with a mean of zero and a covariance represented by k star so here in because we just have one data point this would be uh, k of x star x star and that would be equal to one because uh, it's the same data point now we can uh, if you remember from one of the previous slides where we talked about joint distribution so here now we are looking at a joint gaussian between the data that we had and this particular new magenta data point and that is represented by this equation down below where we have the top right corner we have the k11 through k33 that's from this part and then we have these additional terms k1 star 2 star 3 star then we have transpose of that right here and then we have k star star written on the bottom right corner and again assuming that the mean is zero and then the feature and the function vector here has f star which is uh, uh representing the value for uh, uh, the data point x star and if we abbreviate uh, these four matrices within this larger matrix as k k star k star star and k star transpose then uh, we can uh, uh, find the mean and variance for this new data point by this relation shown here on the left hand side so here uh, the mean uh, mu star would be expectation of x star f star which is given by k transpose k inverse f and then for variance uh, sigma star we have k transpose k inverse k star plus k star star and i know that i'm just walking through these uh, math equations uh, without any derivation uh, if you need derivations uh, uh, they are uh, lengthy derivations and they are in the references uh, the idea here that i wanted to bring about is just to give you an intuition of what is happening uh, in the background with these gaussian processes when we implement them in scikit-learn we won't see any of this and it will be just two three lines of code but then to tune the parameters we if we know what goes on with the covariance matrices or kernels then it will help us get intuition about how to tune those parameters or what should be the values of those parameters or ranges of values so with that these are the two relations then that can be used to find the mean and variance for that new test data point and with and one another power point I wanted to make here is that the mu star is denoting the value of f uh, 
and the sigma star denotes the spread of the uh, possible prediction so the value for this uh, mu star could be anywhere in the range uh, along this magenta line and not just at the point where this particular dot is drawn now along the same lines if we look at this plot we have this prediction shown here in the magenta solid line uh, that views through all the data points and for each of these test points shown in the magenta we have these error bars which are uh, let's assume those are standard deviation error bars and then we have this dotted blue line along it which shows the which shows the boundaries for the confidence interval so uh, let's say for this particular dot on the top right this va the value for the that particular prediction of x could be anywhere in this range right from the top blue line to the bottom blue line and so what that tells us the uncertainty is high if uh, in this case where are where we do not have any observed data and cases where we have observed data such as shown here by the orange dot there the confidence interval margins are much narrower and if we have a um, magenta data point that's close to such an observed data point such as shown here in the bottom left then as you can see we have a smaller confidence margin and so uh, we can uh, have the predicted values uh, for which we can be confident that they have a lesser error as compared to the ones that could be predicted in the top right corner and we'll see in the implementation uh, where we'll try to predict values over time and let's say we have from the year 2000 to 2010 we have data and for that we have very good predictions and after that we'll see that the confidence interval uh, uh, drastically increases because we do not have the data for future years for which we are trying to make predictions using gaussian process so formally the gaussian process uh, is uh, says as it is a gaussian distribution or functions uh, or uh, it can also be said as a collection of random variables uh, any finite number of which have a joint gaussian distribution so uh, we looked at what how the joint gaussian distribution works and we also looked at what these functions uh, what these functions mean uh, we haven't uh, seen actual visualization of that and we'll see that in the next video uh, for different kernels and the formally then the equation can be written summarized as here where f of x is a gaussian process uh, that is based on the mean of x and then covariance of x uh, which is given by k of x x transpose and each of these can be found by the equations written below and in gaussian processes we'll often see two variations one is noisy and noiseless uh, variation and in the real world data most of the cases you'll see the data has some noise in it so here we'll try to put this in mathematical terms so here on the left hand side we have the noise less version where we have the values for f um, the vector f comes from a normal gaussian with mean uh, given by this mu vector and the coherence given by this vector k and we can calculate the posterior as shown here and from that we can get the mean and the variance for the posterior now in case of noisy gaussian what we would do is replace this uh, value of notation for f by y so y here denotes f plus e which is epsilon which is the error or the noise and the noise again we assume that it comes from a gaussian distribution with mean zero and variance sigma square y and uh, accordingly we then change this k to k of y and then uh, again the rest of the format is similar we calculate the posterior by this relation a mean uh, for the posterior and 
variance for the posterior and finally for uh, when we are talking about kernels uh, so far one from what we have seen we are assuming that there are no parameters involved in uh, performing the fit however uh, when we are using the kernels there are some uh, kernel parameters that we need to tune and so that is done by the optimization algorithms where we are trying to uh, model it based on the log of marginal likelihood as shown by these two relations here and we won't go into the details of what these are or how these were uh, derived but just so you know that uh, in scikit-learn when we fit a model we would be looking at these uh, log marginal likelihood values to see how the fit was so that was it for this video i hope in this video you got an intuition about what is gaussian uh, what a, what are covariances how they are useful in understanding the similarity or the distances between data points and how we can I use uh, coherence matrices from the observed or trained data and the test data to find out the predicted region of confidence interval around the test data points. And we also looked at the math um, notation or mathematical uh, uh, relations that go along with this particular. Uh, ideas in the gaussian processes in next video we'll look at what scikit-learn has to offer in uh, uh, when we are trying to model gaussian processes until then please like share and subscribe if you have any comments or suggestions please let me in the comment section below i hope to see you all in the next video thank you